This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue to look at the uprisings against police brutality and racism, I want to turn to a conversation Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh and I had in early June with the scholars Kianga Yamata-Taylor of Princeton University and Cornell West of Harvard University. I began by asking Professor Kianga Yamata-Taylor to talk about the mass uprising and the police killing of George Floyd. Thank you, Amy, for um, letting me come on uh, this morning to, to talk. Um, you know, I think part of what we are seeing is uh, years and years of, of pent-up rage. Everyone, you know, many people have referenced the 1960s, have referenced um, Ferguson in 2014. Um, but I think it's important to say that these are not just repeats of, of past events. These are um, the consequences of the failures of this government and the political establishment, the economic establishment of this country to resolve those crises. And so they build and accumulate um, over time. And we are watching the, the, the boiling over of that. Imagine how angry, desperate, uh, rage-filled you would have to be to come out and protest in the conditions of a historical pandemic that has already killed over 103,000 uh, Americans, that has had a disproportionately horrendous impact um, in black communities. I believe 23 or 24,000 black people have died. Uh, to put it more bluntly, one in every 2,000 African Americans in the United States um, has died as a result of COVID. So imagine how difficult uh, uh, things have to be um, for people to come out uh, in those conditions. So I think that the the, the buildup of, around police brutality, the continuation uh, of police brutality, um, police abuse and violence and murder has compelled people uh, to have to endure those conditions, because it is obvious that there is either nothing that our government can do about this, or that the government is complicit and chooses not to do anything uh, about this. And I think that we have to add to that the, the crisis um, that is unfolding uh, beyond police brutality in the country as well, because we all know that the, the videotapes of police beatings, uh, abuse, murder have never stopped. Uh, so the movement that, that grew out of the Ferguson uprising that became Black Lives Matter, the conditions that led to that never actually ended. And I think that what has reignited that is obviously the public lynching of George Floyd uh, one week ago in, Min in, Minneapolis, in Minneapolis, but also the conditions, the wider context within which um, that is, is spilling over. And because of that wider condition of mass unemployment, of uh, uh, the, the, the death that has been uh, caused by the, uh, by the pandemic, that this is not just, I don't believe, these are just protests around uh, or against police brutality. Um, but we see a lot of hundreds, if not thousands, of young white people um, in uh, these uh, uprisings, making these multiracial uh, rebellions, really. And I think that that is important. Some people have uh, sort of uh, described the participation of white people as outside agitators, or I know that there are reports of white supremacists uh, infiltrating some of the demonstrations. And I think that those are things that we have to pay attention to, keep track of, and try to understand. But I think the we cannot wide, dismiss in a widespread way the participation uh, of young white people, because we have to see that what has happened over the last decade has gutted their lives, too. And, and there has been some discussion about this uh, with perhaps their parents' generation, with the, uh, the, the description of deaths by uh, despair. So we know that the life expectancy of ordinary white men and women has gone into reverse, something, by the way, that does not typically happen in the developed world. And it is driven by opioid addiction, alcoholism, and suicide. And so this generation, whose lives really, you know, if you've graduated from college, your lives 
life has been bracketed by war at the turn of the 21st century, by recession, and now by a deadly pandemic. Um, and so I think we're seeing the convergence of a class rebellion with racism and racial terrorism at the center of it. Um, and in many ways, we are in uncharted territory in the United States. Dr. Cornell West, could you respond to what uh, uh, Professor Yamata Taylor said? You agree uh, that, of course, the uh, a murder of George Floyd was a lynching. You've also said that his murder and the demonstrations that have followed show that uh, uh, America is a failed social experiment. So could you respond to that and also the way that the state and police forces have responded to the protests uh, following uh, uh, George Floyd's killing with the National Guard called out in so many cities and states across the country? Well, there's no doubt that uh, this is America's moment of reckoning. But we want to make the connection between the local and the global. Because, you see, when you sow the seeds of greed, domestically, inequality, globally, imperial tentacles, 800 military units abroad, violence in Africa and Africa, supporting various regimes, dictatorial ones in Asia and so forth, there is a connection between the seeds that you sow of violence externally and internally. Same is true in terms of the seed of hatred, of white supremacy, hating black people, anti-blackness, hatred having its own dynamic within the context of a predatory capitalist civilization obsessed with money, 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 domination of workers, marginalization of those who don't fit, gay brothers, lesbian sisters, trans, and so forth. So it's precisely this convergence that my dear sister Professor Taylor is talking about of the ways in which the American empire imploding, its foundations being shaken with uprisings from below. The catalyst was certainly Brother George Floyd public lynching. But the, the failures of the predatory capitalist economy to provide the satisfaction of the basic needs of food and health care and quality education, jobs with a decent wage, at the same time, the collapse of your political class, the collapse of your professional class, their legitimacy has been radically called into question, and that's multiracial. It's the neo-fascist dimension in Trump. It's the neoliberal dimension in Biden and Obama and the Clintons and so forth. And it includes much of the media. It includes much, many of the professors in universities. The young people are saying, you all have been hypocritical. You haven't been concerned about our suffering, our misery, and we no longer believe in your legitimacy. And it spills over into violent explosion. And, it, and it's here, I won't go on, but I mean, it's here where I think um, Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, Rabbi Heschel and Edward Zaid and especially Brother Martin and, and Malcolm, uh, their legacies, I think, become more central because they provide the kind of truth telling. They provide the connection between justice and compassion in their example, in their organizing, and that's what is needed right now. Rebellion is not the same thing in any way as revolution. And what we need is a nonviolent revolutionary project of full-scale democratic sharing, power, wealth, resources, respect, organizing, and the fundamental transformation of this American empire. And your thoughts, uh, Professor West, on uh, the governor of Minnesota saying they're looking into white supremacist connections to uh, the looting and the burning of the city, and then President Trump tweeting that he's going to try to put Antifa, um, the anti-fascist activists, on the terror list, which he cannot do, uh, and William Barr emphasizing this, saying he's going after the far left to investigate. No, I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, you remember, Sister uh, Amy, and I love and respect you so, that uh, um, Antifa saved my life in Charlottesville. There's no doubt about it. 
that they provided the security, you see. So the very notion that they become candidates for a terrorist organization, but the people who are trying to kill us, the Nazis, the Klan, they're not candidates for a terrorist uh, uh, organization status. But that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a Trump-led, neo-fascist backlash and, and clamp down on what is going on. We ought to be very clear about that. That neo-fascism neo -fascism has that kind of obsession with militaristic imposition in, in the face of any kind of disorder. And so we got to be we got to be fortified for that. But most importantly, I think we've got to make sure that we preserve our own moral, spiritual quality, our fundamental focus on truth and justice, and keep track of legalized looting, Wall Street greed, legalized murder, police. Legalize murder abroad in Yemen, in Pakistan, in Africa, with AFRICOM, and so forth. That's where our focus has to be, because with all of this rebellious energy, it's got to be channeled through organizations rooted in a quest for truth and justice. Professors Cornell West and Kianga Yamata Taylor. We'll hear more from them in a moment. But first, let's turn to former Women's March co chair Tamika Mallory. She spoke at a rally in Minneapolis days after the police killed George Floyd. We are not responsible for the mental illness that has been inflicted upon our people by the American government, institutions, and those people who are in positions of power. I don't give a damn if they burn down Target, because Target should be on the streets with us, calling for the justice that our people deserve. Where was AutoZone at the time when Philando Castile was shot in a car, which is what they asked? represent. Where were they? So if you are not coming to the people's defense, right. then don't challenge us when young people and other people who are frustrated and instigated by the people you pay, you are paying instigators to be among our people out there throwing rocks, breaking windows, and burning down buildings. And so young people are responding to that. They are enraged, and there's an easy way to stop it. Arrest the cops. Charge the cops. Charge all the cops. Not just some of them. Not just here in Minneapolis. Charge them in every city across America where our people are being murdered. Charge them everywhere. That's the bottom line. Charge the cops. Do your job. Do what you say this country is supposed to be about, the land of the free for all. It has not been free for black people, and we are tired. Don't talk to us about looting. Y'all are the looters. America has looted black people. America looted the Native Americans when they first came here. So looting is what you do. We learned it from you. We learned violence from you. We learned violence from you. The violence was what we learned from you. So if you want us to do better, then damn it, you do better. Tamika Mallory speaking in uh, Minneapolis over the weekend. Uh, Professor Kianga Yamata Taylor, if you could respond I mean, to her extraordinary uh, speech. And also the way in which public officials, including liberal officials like uh, New York City Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio, have responded to the protests, uh, simultaneously saying they feel the pain of the protesters, uh, but condemning uh, uh, the violence and looting, as they say, uh, that have happened during the demonstrations. And then the fact that there are many who've been calling for defunding the police uh, uh, in response to, to what's happened here. I mean, one of the things that's been so remarkable about the images everywhere uh, are the, the kind of military gear that so many of these police officers are wearing. I mean, one Democratic senator, uh, Brian Schatz from Hawaii, uh, tweeted Sunday in response saying that he's introducing an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act to discontinue the program that transfers military weaponry to local police departments. Uh, Professor uh, Kianga Yamata-Taylor, if you could respond. Yeah, there are just, there's so many things to say about this. Um, I think, the, I mean, one thing that becomes so apparent with the, the cops on the street, one, you understand, I mean, for most of America, you get a glimpse 
of why people are so angry. I mean, look at the kind of wanton, rec reckless uh, uh, abuse and violence uh, that the police are instigating and attacking uh, people who are trying to, to uh, protest. I feel like what we've seen uh, over the weekend is a, a national police riot. Um, and, you know, it's no wonder they feel emboldened by the white nationalism of the uh, president of the United States. Um, and really the lawlessness of the Republican Party writ large. And so um, I, it feels like we're bearing the consequences um, of that. But I think that there is a, a bigger issue um, about the cops that is also uh, worth talking about, which is why these police are um, never uh, arrested, prosecuted, punished, really, uh, even beyond just you know arresting and prosecuting people, but just punishing them um, as public servants uh, for uh, their their kind of uh, racist, abusive, and violent um, behavior. And I think that, you know, regardless of what these elected officials have to say, um, I think that we're actually going to see a lot more of this, which is why the, the conflicts um, will continue. And the reason why I say that um, is because it has been a strategy of cities across this country that have committed themselves to not investing in the civic and public se sector infrastructure. Uh, so public schools, public hospitals, uh, public libraries, um, all of the things that um, make a city function, those have been systematically defunded, um, increasingly privatized. And the way that cities manage the inevitable crises that arise from that when combined with unemployment, when combined with poverty, when combined uh, with uh, evictions and all of the insecurities that we see racking cities across this country, the police are used to manage that crisis. And that is why in city after city, as other public institutions take financial hits, as other public institutions uh, are, are defunded, it's the police that always get to maintain their budgets. And we look around now where, because of the COVID crisis, every city is talking about massive budget cuts, but not to the police. The police almost never have to incur layoffs. They never have to incur budget cuts because they are seen as the public policy of last resort. And so this is, when we talk about defunding the police, it is that the police should not be absorbing a third of the budget, as they do in cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, while we're closing public schools, while public hospitals don't have the proper uh, uh, per personal protective equipment. Look at the way that police are the gear and the equipment that they have compared to uh, hospital workers dressing themselves in garbage ba bags, being forced to use the same N95 masks for weeks at a time. Look at the contrast between that, and then you understand what the actual priorities of the governing uh, uh, politicians and bodies are, which is why, and this is the last thing I'll say, the, the hypocrisy of someone like Andrew Cuomo or Bill de Blasio, or any of these politicians coming on television, on their uh, uh, the press conference, wringing their hands about uh, the police, uh, uh, talking about these issues as if they are passive bystanders or just concerned citizens, and not elected officials who have power, who have authority, who have the ability to punish the police, who have the ability to make budgetary priorities, who have the ability to shift resources in one direction or another, but they sit back and act as if they are just watching the train wreck in slow motion and not that they are actually in control of the gears. And this is part of the hypocrisy that is making people so angry, is that we have these the people, these elected officials getting on television, talking about how terrible this is. Andrew Cuomo saying, say her name. Andrew Cuomo, do your job. And I think that this is part of what is forcing people to feel that they have no other choice, no other response than to rebel, because the levers and mechanisms of government that are supposed to attend to these issues have shown themselves to be completely broken. Professor Cornell West, uh, if you could comment on what uh, Professor Kianga 
Yamata Taylor said, and also the fact that some observers are saying that all of these emergencies occurring simultaneously, the economic emergency with over 40 million Americans now unemployed, uh, the health crisis with the uh, uh, pandemic, that these could result, and then of course the, these protests across the country, that these could result in some significant structural uh, transformation within the U.S. as occurred uh, in part following the, the Great Depression and the protests of 68. Uh, do you agree with that? And if so, what kind of transformation do you think is essential? Well, I would just want to say first, just ditto to what Sister Taylor said. And uh, I want to say, uh, of course, send my salute to uh, Brother Bakari. He's part of a family of political royalty with Brother Cleveland and, and, and others uh, in so many ways. But I think we also have to be very candid about the decadent leadership class. That, that when, when Sister Taylor talks about Cuomo and the others, Absolutely. But you see, we, we, we've had a black leadership that has so sanitized and deodorized the black freedom struggle that you end up with neoliberal politicians who have accommodated themselves to the Wall Street greed. That's why they bail out Wall Street rather than everyday people. They have accommodated themselves to the killing machine of the Pentagon and State Department. That's why they can vote for budgets where 53 percent of every cent goes to the military and there's no money left for investment in education, health care, jobs with a living wage. And we haven't had enough organized voices to bring critique to bear on that kind of decrepit, neoliberal black leadership. And, and, and Obama's at the center of it. The black caucus is at the center of it. Black professionals are at the center of it. And these cowardly black celebrities, not all of them, but most of them, are at the center of it. So their lives become simply lives of luxury and, and, and exemplary of success and have little to do with service to poor people, have little to do with sacrificing for working people. So when Martin King can say, my country is the biggest purveyor of violence in the world, that takes courage. In 68, takes courage today. That's the kind of courage we need. Malcolm would be the same way. Fannie Lou, Ella Baker, these are not just names. They exemplify something that's deep and rich in the history of a hated people who've taught the world so much about love. That's my tradition, the greatness of black people, not the cowardliness of black people. We got both in our community, but to our tradition of telling the truth and being willing to live and die for justice, that is what is necessary in this moment of reckoning. And we don't, young folk hardly see it at all. Hardly see it at all because so many of the professionals have simply been bought off. They sold out. They're indifferent. They're too callous to the plight of their poor and working class, not just black, everybody, not just here, but around the world, the wretched of the earth that the great Franz Fanon wrote about with such power. Harvard professor Cornell West and Princeton professor Kianga Yamata Taylor. If you'd like to watch the whole conversation with them, as well as Angela Davis and more, go to democracynow.org. That does it for today's show. Democracy Now! is produced by a remarkable team in the studios and sheltering at home. We want to thank each and every one of them. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Libby Rainey, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Jarena Nadura, Sam Alkoff, Tay Marie Astudio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Massoud, Adriano Contreras, and Maria Tarasena. Our general manager is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Miriam Bernard, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Mike Burke, Hugh Grant, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, and Dennis McCormick. I am Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay safe.